On this Monday night, heartbreaking developments in a case that's been full of them. Toronto police taking the unusual step of releasing the photo of a dead man. Killed, they believe, by Bruce MacArthur, hoping someone, anyone will identify him. This is they also revealed the remains of a seventh person were found at a Toronto home. We'll look at the challenges investigators face to identify the victims. We're also following a mystery in Europe. Did someone poison a former Russian spy? And Justin Trudeau and Donald Trump talk tariffs and trade. The National starts now. We begin in Toronto, where police have hit a roadblock in their investigation of an alleged serial killer. Ioana Romiliotis was there today when they reluctantly offered the public a key and disturbing clue. I do not want to release this picture, and I'm doing so as a last resort. It was an extraordinary move, releasing a photo of a dead man. I've never done this, and I, I, I do it uh, with great hesitation. Uh, it's obviously a, a key piece of evidence that we have that we're releasing, but we do feel that by releasing it, hopefully we can identify him and, and close off that area of investigation. Police won't say where they got the picture or where they think it was taken, but will say they believe the man is yet another victim of accused serial killer Bruce MacArthur. They need to know who he is. We have utilized numerous investigative techniques to identify this individual and so far have been unsuccessful. The photo is disturbing, even more so considering it may be a trophy shot of sorts. Experts say it's typical for serial killers to collect souvenirs of their crimes. Police have seized evidence from MacArthur's apartment, including his computer, and more from inside a house where he stored his landscaping tools. And from that same house, from those same planters containing body parts, police now say they have the remains of a seventh victim. They may or may not belong to the mystery man. We've shown this picture to, uh, to several people, and we don't know who this gentleman is. So I'm sure someone will recognize him or think they rec recognize him, and I would ask anyone who does, please call us as soon as possible. It is a horrific puzzle. The grisly toll now. Seven sets of remains, three of which have been identified. Four others are still undergoing forensic analysis. The challenge, matching those remains to victims who may not have been reported missing. Police have circulated the photo they released today to community groups in Toronto's Gay Village. It's hard to look at, but some say it's the least everyone should try to do. Well, I think they have to find out who he is. Um, for his dignity and hopefully f for his family and his friends. Nikki Ward is a well-known advocate in the community. She's circulating the picture too. Looks familiar? Yeah, probably from around. Yeah, around the neighborhood. All of the people who uh, were victims were in our neighborhood at one time or another. And so whether we knew them well or we knew them by face, uh, they were part of our community. Uh, so, yes, there's, a, there's an eerie familiarity about it. And Joanna is joining us now. So, MacArthur is facing six charges, first-degree murder. Now there's a new photo and word of more remains. Why not a new charge? Ideally, they want a name to build more evidence against MacArthur. So that's what they're hoping to get. And they're optimistic that they will get it. They have the time. Their main suspect is behind bars. And already, they've received calls today after they released the photo. So they're pretty optimistic they'll get the information. You've been staying in pretty close contact with, with these detectives. What's your sense of, of what's next from them? Well, there's definitely the forensics that they're waiting on. They're still combing through his computer and his digital footprint. And then in terms of physical evidence, there's several other properties they want to examine. And that will probably happen sometime in the spring when the ground literally defrosts a little bit. Just time. Yeah. Okay, Joanna, thanks very much. You're welcome. CBC News has confirmed police don't have all the body parts of MacArthur's alleged victims, and that poses another problem for investigators. If you have an incomplete set of remains, it may be very difficult to ascertain the cause of death. Decomposition is another challenge for investigators, although a forensic anthropologist told CBC News today hiding body parts in planters may have actually helped to preserve them. We still have four sets of unidentified remains, and we've gone through fingerprints and dental records. We're now into the DNA process. That process can be time-consuming. 
And if you consider that if the person was never reported missing and there's no family member to test DNA against, then you have, you know, even more challenges in what's already a pretty complex investigation. Yeah, absolutely, Adrian. Meantime, in the UK, another challenging police investigation with international implications. When someone suddenly collapses with no apparent cause, it raises questions. But when that person is a former Russian spy, it raises alarms. What happened to Sergei Skripal? As Thomas Daigle tells us today, in the southern English town of Salisbury, police are dealing with a mystery. Police worked well into the night, carefully examining the site of a bizarre incident they still can't explain. It happened yesterday in a shopping area under the spot now marked by that blue tent. There was a couple, um, an older guy and a younger girl. She was sort of lent in on him. It looked like she'd passed out, maybe. He was doing some strange hand movements, looking up to the sky. Police say the two were found unconscious, though with no visible injuries, likely exposed to an unknown substance. They were rushed to hospital, where authorities today declared a major incident. I can confirm that they're currently being treated here at Salisbury District Hospital and that their condition does remain critical. Authorities didn't name the two hospitalized, but British media identified the man as 66-year-old Sergei Skripal, a former Russian spy convicted in 2006 in a Moscow military court of treason. He's thought to have sold the names of Russian operatives to Britain's MI6. Then four years later, a deal between Russia and the U.S. saw prisoners from both countries flown to freedom, including the colorful Anna Chapman, a Russian sleeper agent arrested by the FBI, and the lower-profile Skripal, granted refuge in England. Police kept a close eye on his home today. We are conducting some extensive inquiries to determine exactly what led to these two people falling unconscious and to clarify whether or not any criminal activity has taken place. They left without saying whether the pair could have been poisoned. Still, the case reminds many here of the story of Alexander Litvinenko. The former Russian spy turned MI6 informant was killed in this posh hotel in 2006 with radioactive polonium in a cup of tea. A public inquiry found the death was likely approved by President Vladimir Putin. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. Now, the mysterious illnesses in Salisbury today may have nothing to do with the Kremlin, but for Russian officials, past or present, there are good reasons to look over your shoulder. Here are just a few recent examples. In December 2016, a senior Russian diplomat was found dead in his Moscow home with a pillow over his head covering a gunshot wound. That same month, a former general in the Russian intelligence service, the FSB, was found dead in his car, parked on a Moscow street. And in August 2017, a Russian politician, critical of the Kremlin, was gunned down in Kiev in broad daylight. Well, now to another big international story with potentially serious implications for Canadians. Rosie. That's right, Andrew. NAFTA negotiations. There is now a new sense of urgency tonight because U.S. President Trump is using his proposed tariffs on steel and aluminum to goose the sluggish trade talks. As Katie Simpson explains, he's dangling potential exemptions as a NAFTA sweetener. Canadian steel workers are already starting to feel the effects of a looming trade war. I really have no choice but to increase my prices. Ryan Jordan employs six people at a small operation in Windsor, Ontario. He says he'll have to cut jobs if planned U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum are not stopped. If the numbers start to climb to an extra 10, 15 percent, 20, 25 percent, uh, I'll have to look at other materials. Are you going to back down on the tariffs? No, we're not backing down. Donald Trump could introduce the tariffs as early as this week and offered a clue today as to why. It could be a part of NAFTA, and I understand I just got a call from the people who are right now in Mexico City negotiating NAFTA. Uh, Mexico and really Canada want to talk about it. The U.S. is promising to exempt both Canada and Mexico from the tariffs only if they agree to a new NAFTA on American terms. The pitch comes as the seventh round of talks wrapped up in Mexico City. 
Canada sees these issues as separate concerns and is not ruling out taking separate action against the U.S. over the tariffs. Should restrictions be imposed on Canadian steel and aluminum products, Canada will take appropriate, responsive measures to defend our trade interests and our workers. Canada is still considering its next moves. When the U.S. imposed tariffs on softwood lumber last year, the Liberals came up with an $800 million aid package. Not everyone in the industry thinks that's the best way forward. We're not asking for handouts. You, you know, we don't want a dollar. What we want to do is operate freely and fairly in the market. All of this uncertainty may actually be helping the Trump administration. If companies are uncertain about whether NAFTA is going to go away or not, they're more likely to place their future investments in the largest market, which is the United States. Late tonight, the Prime Minister was here in his office, where he held a phone call with Trump. Justin Trudeau highlighted the progress made in this round of NAFTA talks and warned the president any new tariffs would not be helpful in reaching a deal. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Fears of that so-called trade war and the NAFTA concerns are certainly weakening the Canadian dollar. The loony dipped below 77 cents at one point this afternoon. That's the lowest level against the U.S. dollar since last July. There has been emotional reaction to a damning report about the death of an Indigenous man in Thunder Bay. As we told you first last night, an independent review found police did not conduct a proper investigation because of racism and neglect of duty. Today, the victim's brother says those findings came as no surprise to him. It seems like everybody just uh, being put aside, like, oh, the, their lives don't matter or whatnot because they're Indians and native people and this and that, so. 41-year-old Stacy DeBungi was found dead in the McIntyre River in the fall of 2015. Police decided quickly he fell into the river, drunk. An independent review has now backed up the findings of a 2016 private investigation and a Fifth Estate documentary, saying there was no basis to affirmatively rule out foul play. And that investigators' premature conclusion may have been drawn because the deceased was Indigenous. Cameron McIntosh is in Thunder Bay with reaction. Just the way that they said that he found him. Brad DeBungi never believed what police told him, that his brother Stacy drowned here on Thunder Bay's McIntyre River after passing out on the riverbank. Even after his band's counsel hired an investigator and found evidence to the contrary, he couldn't get police to listen. I was up against a brick wall and they wouldn't answer my questions and this and that. And, they, and just how, how, how they came to the assumption that he rolled into the water and drowned. Concerns now confirmed by Ontario's independent police review director, who says police not only jumped to conclusions, they were negligent, overlooking evidence and possibly discriminatory because of Debungi's Indigenous status. No surprise to Indigenous leaders here. Somebody made the assumption that it's just another drunk Indian rolling in the river. Today, chiefs representing northwestern Ontario and Debungi's home First Nation repeated calls for Thunder Bay Police Chief J.P. Levesque to resign. And if he refuses to resign, I'm calling for the board to fire him. Levesque isn't talking. Neither is the police service nor the police board that oversees it, citing privacy concerns. This is not the first time racism has been a central issue in Thunder Bay. Debungi died while there was an inquest underway into deaths of seven Indigenous youths in Thunder Bay, which resulted in recommendations to police and authorities. Right. I no longer trust the Thunder Bay police. Tonight in Thunder Bay, a community talk at the university on racism and plenty of acknowledgement of tensions existing in the community. I see blatant systemic racism every day. I mean, our headlines show it. It's like everyone has their own uh, personal like safety guides of how to survive in Thunder Bay. Travis Hayes' father was once deputy chief of police here at a time when many are talking about the justice system. In the cases of Colton Bushy and Tina Fontaine, he calls this an example of prejudice. It really shows that it's not just the court systems, it's not just getting better representation on juries, it's also about challenging these cultures within policing institutions that really devalue the lives of Indigenous peoples. As for the officers cited in the report, the Independent Police Review Director says there are grounds for non-criminal professional misconduct charges. So far, no hearings have been set. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Thunder Bay.
As Cam mentioned, at the time of Dabungi's death, an inquest was underway into the deaths of seven young Indigenous people, five of whom had been found in Thunder Bay waterways under similar circumstances. Police were also accused of rushing to the assumption that those deaths were accidents. This latest review calls that troubling, saying one would have reasonably expected that investigators would be particularly vigilant in ensuring that the sudden death of an Indigenous man found in the river was thorough. Unfortunately, the opposite was true here. Here's what else we're working on tonight for The National. Russia's troll factory, a peek inside the operation that's turned internet hacking into an art. On The National documentary, meet the doctor whose practice is one of the most challenging in Canada. And behind the buzzwords that had a lot of people talking after last night's Oscar ceremony, inclusion rider. Actors in unison, um, if they embrace this, as I said, this could create uh, uh, shifts almost overnight. I look forward to being there, and I'm very proud of that decision. Tonight on The National, the U.S. president says he may go to Israel for the opening of the new embassy in Jerusalem. Donald Trump met today with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the White House. It was their first meeting since Trump made the controversial decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. In Syria today, a United Nations convoy of aid trucks finally made it into the rebel-held area of eastern Ghouta. But their mission to get much-needed aid to hundreds of thousands of trapped civilians was reportedly cut short by heavy shelling in the region. UN officials are also reporting that while food parcels were allowed in, Syrian authorities removed most of the medical supplies from the trucks. È una vittoria straordinaria che ci carica di orgoglio, di gioia, di responsabilità. That's the leader of the far-right anti-immigrant League party, declaring victory after yesterday's election in Italy. But who will actually form government is still far from clear, as no party secured enough votes to lead. What we do know is that yesterday's vote was a big win for Italy's anti-establishment populist protest parties. Together, they took more than 50% of the vote. They have a shared skepticism of the European Union, and what Italian voters just did will send shockwaves through it. Well, these days, where there are tensions and divisions, there are concerns about how foreign actors exploit them. The most prominent, Russia. The U.S. Special Counsel investigating the 2016 election of Donald Trump recently indicted 13 Russians linked to this nondescript building in St. Petersburg. It housed the Internet Research Agency, a so-called troll factory. From there, they allegedly conducted a multi-year effort online to shape opinion, divide Americans, and ultimately to help Donald Trump. Well, former trolls are speaking out, saying that was just one operation among many, targeting politics both within and beyond Russia's borders. And some of them spoke with the CBC's Chris Brown. Uh, troll factory. Uh, St. Petersburg's notorious troll factory is finally giving up its secrets thanks to a few brave former workers such as Vitaly Bispelov. 200 people. Most, most, most 200 people. The 26-year-old journalism grad became a troll by accident in late 2014 when he answered an ad at the Internet Research Agency. I figured out early that the main goal was to create a picture of the world and the Internet that mirrored what was being shown on Russian television. Bespelov was put on the Ukraine desk. Russia's covert support for rebels in eastern Ukraine was underway, so anything that made Ukrainian government soldiers look bad was a priority, especially stories about dead children. We saw a news story that some militiamen were hiding in the school in Donbass and it was being shelled. Some children died. The facts were unclear, says Bespelov, but that didn't matter. We simply took the news stories and wrote that Ukrainian soldiers shot and killed the children. That's it. No hesitation. 
Murat Mindyarov spent three months as a troll in early 2015. Under the fake name Ivan Putkin, he was told to use the comment section to rebut critical stories about the Kremlin. What kinds of things were they asking you to write? Things that applauded the United States or things that applauded Russia? Applauded Russia, of course, and unfortunately, and that's the uh, horror to hate America. The pay was good, he says, a thousand Canadian dollars a month. But he said it was soul-destroying, so he left after three months. It was not criminal in the terms of the law. It was a criminal in the terms of the ethic and moral. Since he's spoken out, Mindyarov has been detained by police. Why Bespelov has endured ridicule on Russian state TV. <laughs> he was portrayed as a hard-partying opposition supporter, not worth listening to. Bespelov says he's speaking out, hoping such fake news factories will be shut down. I didn't like the atmosphere of lies and distortion. I see this in Russia, and I don't like it. In St. Petersburg, our CBC crew stopped by the troll factory. The security guard wasn't happy. He told us not to come back. Most workers cleared out a few months ago. Russian media has reported they've relocated to a new site. Both men were gone long before the alleged U.S. election tampering, but both also say they're sure such meddling is still going on. Chris Brown, CBC News, St. Petersburg. That was fascinating. Still ahead on The National, Francis McDormand picked up an Oscar and dropped two words that left the audience applauding and a little bit confused. So what is an inclusion rider? And on the national documentary, how Canada's healthcare system fails remote communities. Even a common allergy is that much more risky for a child in the north. We don't let them go anywhere to go visit other people's homes because of the, what it, all the time it takes for medical help to get here. So you don't let your son go to any other house in the community because of his allergies? He has to stay at home. You know, sometimes I view my role as a physician, sometimes is to minimize the harm that the system is automatically doing to people. Doctors take an oath to do no harm. So imagine how it must feel to work in a healthcare system that's so limited it seems to be hurting your patients. Dr. Mike Curlew treats people in the remote northern reaches of Ontario. And Nick Purden flew along with the doctor to see firsthand how the care falls short. There are times when, you know, a patient might pass away um, because of, you know, lack of access to certain services. It's hard to witness children being denied care. You sometimes go to bed at night, you wonder, how can I function in a system like that? A system that's focused to deny care. <laughs> it can cause you to, to give up hope. Meet Dr. Mike Curley, family physician in Northern Ontario, and one of the few doctors who works in the tiny fly-in communities in the northernmost part of the province. For the past 10 years, he's been fighting a healthcare system that he says actually hurts his patients. But this is Canada. We have some of the best healthcare in the world, and it's for everybody, no matter what, right? Or is that just something we like to tell ourselves? Sioux Lookout, Ontario, a town of 5,000 and a medical hub for the region. If you live in the northernmost part of the province and you get sick, this is one of the places you come. It's also home base for Dr. Curlew. Hey, how are you doing? How was it since he last got sick and stuff? Dr. Curlew's first patient of the day is Bernice Boyce. It's improving. It's improving. That's mm -hmm. good. That's good. She's brought her 14-year-old son Joshua to see him, in part for his asthma. And he's not coughing as much as he was before? No. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. Is he still taking um, the purple puffer, the Advair? What you should know is that for this appointment to happen, for Joshua to get the medical help he needs, he and his mom had to get on a plane and travel 500 kilometers south from their community. When we were 
were back home. Sometimes we didn't even sleep for three nights straight. I know, I know. I he know. would wake up coughing and coughing. struggling to yeah. breathe. Yeah. It was really risky for him to be there because of his asthma. We don't have anything back home. And that's why we are here. The thing is, it's not just Joshua and Bernice who had to leave their home to get health care. So did every person here. This is a 100-bed facility attached to the hospital in Sioux Lookout. It's where patients from the northern communities fly in and stay. And the beds are full. They're almost always full. I've been staying here in the hospital for the last uh, about 18 months now. 18 months because, in this uh, room, alone. Meet Stefan Fiddler from Bearskin Lake. I'm on uh, dialysis, and uh, also I'm uh, going blind, so I need some help while I'm here. And um, I left my family in Bearskin, uh, which is very hard to do, uh, very lonely. <coughs> It's very lonely here in this family and uh, miss uh, things I used to do. How does that make you feel that you had to leave? This is, uh, this is Canada. I think all Canadians should uh, get the same services as people that live in, down south. Sorry for Stefan's in an impossible situation. If he goes home to his community, he'll likely die. And yet, in a way, he's actually one of the lucky ones. Sure, the hostel is as busy as an airport, but not everyone who gets sick in the northern communities even gets to come here. Doctors have to request coverage for their patients, and the government decides who gets to travel. Makes you wonder, if not everyone gets to come here, what's the situation in the communities farther north? I, I love going up there. The next day, Dr. Curlew flies the 500 kilometers north to Wapakika, where he's been working for 10 years. You look out the window and you see how remote it is. This part of northern Ontario is the size of France, with 45,000 people scattered in tiny indigenous communities, many of them you can only get to by plane. If you get sick in Wapakika, you come here, to the nursing station. You probably have to make your own way, of course. There's no ambulance. There's also no x-ray machine or ultrasound, either. Can I get a high five? All right, all right. And there's only a doctor here for about a week every month. Three-year-old Chase is Dr. Curlew's first patient of the day. How's our man doing today? Oh, shoo. He just woke up. He just woke yeah, up? Yeah, he's, uh, oh, he's sick right now. Oh, boy, he's feeling pretty sick, eh? Yeah. Well, it just wasn't working. Today, Chase is here for his rash, he, uh, but what his dad, uh, Jason Baxter, is really stressed yeah, about is his son's out, recent he, allergy uh, attack. He almost died in Thunder Bay. I know, yeah. I know, yeah. So, yeah. lucky thing he was actually in town when it happened, I eh? know, and I not know. up here. I know, I so, so now he walks around with a little EpiPen everywhere he goes. That's good, that's good. That's in my jacket right now. That's good. In Wapakika, a simple peanut allergy is a big deal. What if there's no medication? Dr. Curlew says they've run out before. And if there are any complications, maybe help doesn't arrive in time. But if he would have had peanuts up here on, in the community, he probably would have probably would have died, like up here. So what's that like to live here? Well, we don't let him go anywhere to go visit other people's homes just because of that, in case something does happen over there, because of the, what it, all the time it takes for medical help to get here. So you don't let your son go to any other house in the community because of his allergies? He has to stay at home now. Now that we know, I just don't want to take that chance of it, sending him over there. Yeah. One more high five, awesome. okay? All right. Thanks so much, Jason. All right, doctor. All right, you take care, okay? Take care, All right. At the end of the day, what really hits home are the difficulties people have getting treatment for everyday concerns. This is Jayla. She's seven. She's falling behind at school. And her mom is just trying to get her speech therapy. Hi, Jayla. Hi. How are you doing today? Good. You doing good? How's school going? Good. But speech therapy basically doesn't exist here. 
but that's a real problem in our region is just getting kids access you know access to those services mm -hmm. and even when we do sometimes we can only get them once you know and it's very difficult to get things on an ongoing basis you know mm -hmm. but we're going to try our best we'll try another letter and see what we can do mm -hmm. give me a high five you keep up the good work in school okay mm -hmm. remember you can do dr curlew says he's already written several right. letters trying to get therapy for jayla and that's the thing in Wapakika, Curlew's as much an advocate as a doctor. On most days, he types letters more than he uses his stethoscope. <laughs> One of the realities of life for a northern doctor is you work, sleep, and eat at the nursing station. I wonder how cold it is out there. Uh -huh. They were saying like minus 23, so. On this morning, Dr. Curlew is joined by Saul Mumakla. At least last night. Anyway. Saul's so. official title is health advisor with the Anishinaabe Aski Nation. And it's his job to improve the health care of his people. How many patients do you have to see today? Probably about 20 or so. Saul's in Wapakika to pick Dr. Curlew's brain about how things are going on the ground. We saw so many parents bring in their children looking for, you know, accessing developmental services, right? These services could fly into the community. There could be, th those things are all possible, right? Somehow we need to change that. Yeah. Saul grew up in Kingfisher Lake, just about 50 kilometers away from here. And so he knows firsthand the challenges in the region. Fresh on his mind are the three recent suicides here in Wapakika. And he points out it's not just basic medical needs that are lacking, it's mental health support as well. When you hear of a young girl, boy, 11, 12 years old, dying by suicide, it just pushes you to make more change, bring change for our people. We cannot give up. We cannot. What, what don't people understand about health care in your communities? I hear uh, a lot of, you know, the health care is broken. Um, when you actually think about it, it's not, it's not broken. It is, in fact, doing exactly the way it's been designed to, is to diminish the, the rights of our people, the health of our people. And uh, sometimes I'll even go as far as saying that the, the system is killing our people. Saul's also here to talk to patients who visit the clinic. After John McKay has his appointment with Dr. Curlew, Saul walks him home. Saul acknowledges it won't be easy to fix the health care problems here. And even though both provincial and federal governments have increased funding in recent years, Saul says that's not the answer. It's not just incremental changes. It's not adding money to the existing programs. Incremental change, in fact, you know, perpetuates the crisis in our communities. So we need to dismantle the system and rebuild it up from the community up. And Saul is hopeful that that's possible. This past summer, the provincial and federal governments, along with the Grand Chief, signed an agreement in principle to give health care here over to Indigenous control. Then the day ends. And as I catch up with Dr. Curlew again, off to make a house call, the reality on the ground hits hard. Hi. Hi, Bushu. How are Change you Change can't come fast enough for Donnie and Elsie Brown. That's good. Arms out like this? That's good. Donnie had a stroke good. four years ago. Like how do you find Donnie has, has been doing? Well, the right side. Yeah. He can't feel. feel. Yeah, yeah. Especially on his foot. Yeah, He yeah. gets cold too. Yeah, 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 yeah. On that right side yeah. and stuff, yeah. Because that's the side that was weaker after the aneurysm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the four years since his stroke, Donnie's only had one single rehab appointment. One. That's, that's, that's very true. And so he's not getting any better. You yeah. know that he has. Yeah. Right. I yeah. See you. Yeah. Now I don't see you. Though. No, you don't. Yeah. No. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. See you. Yeah. I see you now. Yeah. yeah. But then when you look over it, yeah. 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 Do you get a lot of help, like? No, it's just me. It's just you and uh, eh? my girls. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I wish I could, you know, provide some home care, you know, yeah. because that would be something that people would get down south is someone to yeah. help, you know, because uh -huh. he needs a lot of assistance, you know. But, yeah. but we, uh, we don't have access to, to that kind of service, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, yeah. Do you think you help people today? You know, they, they have this phrase in medicine called the Hippocratic Oath, right? To do no harm. And, you know, sometimes I view my role as a physician, sometimes is to minimize the harm that the system is automatically doing to people. So maybe I'm a harm minimizer. Do you ever kind of forget that this isn't normal? I, I think I think that's a real temptation, right? You you, you can <laughs> you forget what normal normal is. You have to remind yourself what normal is. You know, that's part of the fight or that's part of the battle. It's just not succumbing to the status quo, right? Continuing to fight, you know? You know, you, you see people that will tell you, we may be down now, but we're gonna be up again. And they can tell you and, and say, don't give up. That's strength. My patients are way stronger than I am. Way stronger. Yeah, that's something. If you wanna hear more from Dr. Curlew, and the challenges of his work in Northern Ontario, we have an extended in-depth conversation with him on our YouTube channel. Pretty incredible story. Okay, still to come this hour. Too bad they don't give out Oscars for best stand-in. Last night, it would have gone to Canada for playing 1960s Baltimore. First of all, thanks to all the Canadian crew who are partying right now at the Palais Royale in Toronto. This is, this is for you. I have two words to leave with you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Inclusion Rider. Best Actress winner, Frances McDormand, with a call to action at last night's Oscars, leaving the audience, well, a little bit confused. But at least one viewer at home knew what she was talking about. And today, our Kim Brunhuber met up with her to learn more about an idea that's suddenly a Hollywood hit. <laughs> Seeing it again now still brings a smile to Stacey Smith's face. It's amazing to rewatch that. The Academy Awards had been pretty boring, she says, until Frances McDormand took the stage and uttered the phrase, Inclusion Rider. That moment, I realized, that's me, that's my team. What if those A-listers simply added an equity clause or an inclusion rider a couple of years ago, the communications professor invented the idea of an inclusion rider, a provision added to actors' contracts to demand that casting and hiring on productions includes a certain number of women, minorities, and people from the LGBTQ community. It had been a fairly unknown concept until the speech that launched a million Google searches. Backstage, Frances McDormand says even she had never heard of the term until last week. The whole idea of women trending, no, no trending. African Americans trending, no, no trending. It changes now. And I think the inclusion rider will have something to do with that. We're going to right? 20. Power, 20. power and rules. Already several high profile Hollywood players like Brie Larson, Elizabeth Banks and Ashley Judd say they're on board. Right now there's an invisible quota in Hollywood and it's called the straight white able-bodied male. And year in and year out, we see that invisible quota at work when the percentage of females on screen hasn't changed in over 60 years. 
And this Canadian film critic says there's no reason such a rider couldn't work on both sides of the border. Telefilm Canada now has a mandate that 50% of the projects that they are funding must have a woman in a power position, either writer, director, or producer. So it's, it's part of how films are funded in this country now. Smith says as far as she's aware, there's only ever been one case of an inclusion rider being adopted, one which yet hasn't been made public. But that may soon change. Actors in unison, um, if they embrace this, as I said, this could create uh, uh, shifts almost overnight. In the words of McDormand, power in rules. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. In case there's any doubt that more diversity is needed in Hollywood, Stacey Smith provided these stats. Of the top 100 films in 2016, 47 had no black female speaking characters on screen, 66 had no Asian women, 72 no Latina, and more than 90 had no women who identify as LGBT. One of the other big storylines from the Oscars, Canadians doing our thing. <laughs> you bet, Rosie. Last night's big winner, The Shape of Water, owes its success in no small way to Canada. See, it was shot in Ontario not just because of what this province looks like or necessarily the tax breaks that draw crews here, but in part because of digital detailing that just doesn't seem to happen anywhere else. First of all, thanks to all the Canadian crew who are partying right now at the Palais Royale in Toronto. This is, this is for you. Uh, thank you Canadians were all over the Oscars. The Shape of Water employed more than 1,500 people from Ontario working in development to post-production. A fierce commitment to Canada by a fierce champion of the industry. This is not a movie that comes to Toronto for a rebate, uses the city and gets the fuck out of there. Guillermo del Toro is a creator of universes, so it was up to Canadians to help transform cities like Toronto or Hamilton into the worlds that live in his mind. A place where the real Massey Hall becomes the imagined Orpheum. We had to build a fake marquee, and then Mr. X, which is also a Canadian company, a digital um, visual effects company, they added the upper part of the marquee, the upper signage. Mr. X, again, visual effects, did a sign on the outside and did a really beautiful job painting a 60s street for us. Overall, about 600 shots, so um, it wound up, I think, just under an hour of screen time that we contributed to, to the movie. And even though the people at Mr. X didn't get nominated for visual effects, they are still proud that Canadians at all levels helped the movie rise above all others. Now, you know, especially on the back of Shape of Water, where you see that all of these department heads from Toronto, from Canada, have been able to deliver the best picture of the year, uh, we're definitely showing that the talent is here. Um, there's a big pool of it across all departments, and uh, uh, the level of service we provide is, is world class. And odd, maybe, that by erasing Canada from the film, the company may have just ended up marking Canada as one of the best places for visual effects. Odd, though, that the TV ratings for last night's ceremony weren't anything to celebrate. In the US, the audience hit an all-time low of 26.5 million viewers. The Canadian audience also dipped from last year. And still ahead, the wannabe Oscar winner the TV audience did not see, and for very good reason. What's up, everybody? Look at I got this! This is mine! Woo! the longest relationship you've ever had. I say you invite Patrick over and have a good old-fashioned Rose family barbecue. I think we're good here. Thanks. We know this is not a spontaneous act um, uh, committed by these people. This was very well planned. We are investigating the possibility that there are people from the outside of this community that committed this, these acts. 
Tonight on The National, police say they're still trying to figure out who was behind Saturday night's vandalism spree in Hamilton, Ontario. Several businesses had their windows smashed and vehicles were damaged by a masked mob of about 30 people. The damage is pegged at over $100,000. They were carrying a banner that read, We are the ungovernables. Not a single person in the group's been identified, and police are calling on anyone with information to come forward. New guidelines could change the way opioid addiction is treated right across the country. Published today in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, a network of doctors recommend increasing access to a medicine known as Suboxo. It's a synthetic opioid, like methadone, but less addictive and with fewer side effects. So those doctors believe it should be the preferred first-line treatment. And parts of southern Manitoba were digging out today after a late season snowstorm. In some communities, as many as 30 centimeters of thick, wet snow fell to the ground. And that caused trouble right across the region. At one point, thousands of people were without power. A number of flights out of Winnipeg were cancelled. And roads and schools in the hardest hit areas were closed. Winter never ends in Winnipeg, that's why. As we showed you earlier, it was a pretty great Oscar night for Frances McDormand. She was out celebrating her Best Actress win at the Governor's Ball, and that is until her Oscar went missing. And the man behind the theft, Terry Bryant, seemed to have gotten away with it until he took to Facebook to post a video of himself and Oscar for the whole world to see, and that is our moment of the day. What's up, everybody? Look at I got this! This is mine! Congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so where's your Jimmy Kimmel party at? I'm about to go to oh, so many gotta, parties. That's your ticket to anything you want to go to. I know. Academy Awards, baby, for music. Oh, you Pop, best producer. Get out of here, really? Look at, look at this. Say hi, everybody. Hello. Look at this. is the real deal. Right here. I have many things to say about that, dude, but I won't. Instead, I'll say this. According to the LAPD, a 47-year-old man was arrested and booked on suspicion of grand theft for allegedly stealing an Oscar, but the police would not confirm if it was McDormand. Uh, not that we know of any others that are missing. Uh, you know, we did a little digging of our own. Turns out this guy appears to be somewhat of a regular at these award shows. I mean, I don't, I don't know if he's invited or if he crashes them, but he has posted <laughs> photos of himself at the Grammys, the SAG Awards, the MTV Music Awards. He's everywhere. Yeah, apparently, though, and this is the kicker here, McDormand had her name engraved on the Oscar before it was stolen. So you got to figure uh, the jig would have been up eventually. It was just a matter of time. And, of course, uh, she did get her Oscar back in the end, so all's well that ends well, I suppose. Good. And that guy we'll see at the next award show, I guess. All right. <laughs> That's the National for May 5th. Good night. Good night. Good night. May. March. Oh, March. <laughs>